I'm going to introduce Mason Kaismore. Uh, I know a lot of you frequent the Kent Farmers Market, so you may recognize him as well as his family from there. Um, the Kaismores are a young family of four, and they make a living solely by farming um, in Portage County. They practice the humane treatment of livestock and raise vegetables naturally. Uh, Mason grew up on his family farm, and he always knew he wanted to continue on that path. Mason is a 2001 graduate of Field High School, and his wife Stacy is a 2004 graduate of James A. Garfield High School. They have been married for, have you been married for 12 years or together 12 years? We've been married for 12. Um, we've been together for almost 19. Oh my gosh, <laughs> okay. Um, well, yeah, I guess how so you guys met at the Randolph Fair in 2002, where Mason was being crowned um, the, where did I just lose that? He had been crowned the Fair King that year. So she went after him after she saw that. Uh, currently, they own, manage, and operate Mason Kaismore Family Farms, LLC, on over 20 acres of land with their two sons, Harlan and Emerson. The Kaismores raise cattle, lamb, chickens, pigs, and thousands of turkeys um, that they distribute every year on Thanksgiving. They are longtime members of the Kent Haymakers Farmers Market, um, and they also partner with Duma Meads Incorporated in Mogador, Ohio. Uh, their family is also very active in the Portage County 4-H Club, uh, where the boys have the opportunity to show and sell their livestock. So Mason's going to tell us a little more about his business. Okay, here we go. Um, <laughs> Amanda touched on a lot of it, who I, who I am, my wife, Stacy. We have two boys. Harland is 11. Emerson is seven. Um, I have farmed my entire life. I started working for my dad as I was, you know, I just, just a kid, um, seven, eight years old, I guess I started working, you could say. Um, worked still still work for him to this day not uh maybe not as much as i used to but uh still there but definitely have my own things going and uh that's what we're going to talk about here now um we lease about approximately 600 acres of land that we grow row crops on and we pasture for animals um we raise beef cattle pigs meat chickens, lambs, Thanksgiving turkeys, and we have laying hens, and we're also now getting a couple uh, milk cows for some reason or another. Um, first, how, how we make a living. Um, we sell cash crops, such as corn and soybeans that we plant. Um, we sell pork, lamb, beef, to individual customers, like a side of freezer beef and stuff. And we also, what, what we don't sell to customers, we sell at a local livestock auction. Um, how I got started, working for my dad. Um, then when I kind of branched out from him, I just did anything I could to just create revenue as we call it in the farm world, generate revenue. Um, my wife, we got married in, I'll get in trouble here, 2008. And she was a hairdresser. So after we had our second child, Emerson in 2014, she said, she didn't really want to go back to cutting hair. She wanted to be a stay-at-home mom, and she began to help with uh, chickens. We got 20 chickens in 2014. That was the start of our egg business. And uh, then that, we uh, after, after we got 20 chickens, we couldn't get rid of all the eggs. We didn't know what we were gonna do. So as in typical farmer fashion, we got 150 more chickens and we talked to Dave Duma and we got licensed and uh, we 
we were able to sell our eggs at a retail store then. So Dave got us started, gladly helped us out. And uh, yeah, we got that going. And then at where we were, we were at on 43 raising chickens. Um, we built another barn there and then we went up to 500 chickens and uh, yeah, it's just been good. So my wife is the, she's the main, main person with the eggs and we sell, we sell about 250 dozen eggs a week, roughly give or take at uh, just various locations, Duma Meats and also at the Kent Haymakers Farmer's Market which we began selling there in 2015. And there we sell eggs, cuts of beef, pork, lamb, chicken, and everything that we sell at that farmer's market, we raise ourselves. which is, you know, it's a big thing for the market, their producer only market. And, uh, the, one of the big hurdles we're facing now for farmers market is getting animals processed locally. These processors are out like a year to 18 months. Whereas a year ago you could call and say, Hey, I want to have a steer processed. They'd say, bring it in next week. So now you've got to try to calculate the best you can when you're going to have animals ready for harvest to make, to schedule an appointment. So that's been one of the, <laughs> the hardest things on us for the last year, really, that threw us a curve for farmer's market. Because as when COVID all came about last March, people started to come more local. So that, that did give us a boost in business as well. So, okay, on to the next thing. Um, our oldest son this year, uh, he, he, he planted a garden and he also planted a, about an acre and a half of popcorn that he, he retailed about 80% of it by itself. He sold some at a craft show and a lot of it at farmer's market. Um, and, uh, yeah, he, he's very active at the farmer's market. He's always there helping me whenever, whenever he can be. And uh, he's, he's actually right here. If you want to say hi, Harlan, that's Harlan. <laughs> um, Harlan participates in the fair as well, like the Randolph Fair and 4-H, as well as I did when I was a kid. I went, I took uh, pigs and steers to the fair, started when I was nine years old. Um, saved all that money and that I made from the fair and I was able to put a down payment on a house when I was, uh, when I was 20, I bought my first house. So, and Harlan, he's doing the same. Emerson's not old enough to be in 4-H yet, but Harlan, he, uh, he's in it. He takes pigs and lambs to the fair and he hopes to save his money so he can tend, uh, attend attend fire academy. So the, the, the turkey, we'll hit on the turkeys here a little bit. Uh, started those back in like 1990. My, my dad had raised them years ago. And then once us kids, I had, I had a brother and two sisters still, still have them have, older sister, older brother, and a younger sister. Um, when we were in 4-H, my dad wanted us to raise turkeys to give the people that bought our animals at the fair, we gave them a fresh turkey as a thank you for supporting us at the fair. So um, my brother, he raised them a couple years after we were out of 4-H, maybe one year, and then he kind of gave up on it and I took it over and it's done nothing but grow. But back in the day, I mean, I used to cold call the neighbors and friends trying to sell them a turkey and it wasn't, it wasn't the funnest thing you ever did, but we sold a few turkeys. Um, then in 2016, 
we started selling turkeys through Duma Meats. And that's when we kind of, I, I guess you could say, went big time with turkeys. Um, we do raise all our turkeys are all raised. We start them in a brooder because they have to be 100 degrees for the first two weeks of their life, which is, it's, it's hard. You got to keep them warm. Um, we start them inside and then at about eh, five to six weeks of age, we start letting them go out once they're big enough that you're not really worried about predators as much. Um, they are all raised on pasture. So, and then they, they do get supplemented feed and all that feed is from corn that we grow and I grind it right here myself. So that's gonna take us to the, the grain farming end of the deal now. Um, we lease all the land that we farm. Um, everything is basically leased by the year or by two or three years, you lease it at a time. Um, we plant corn, soybeans, and hay, and the soybeans are sold for a cash crop. Uh, the corn, we keep keep a good bit of the corn for feed. You never want to run out of feed, and uh, we keep all the hay as feed as well. So, um, the we'll hit on like planting and stuff just. For the, the generation before me, they, uh, it's just how things have changed in planting now. We use everything we do that we plant with is GPS. Um, it, it's, just, it's just amazing what the technology that's out there, and I'm not even on the cutting edge of it, but we're trying our tractors, you know, the planting tractor steers itself. It's, it's just pretty pretty amazing so we can touch on that later um our farm we moved from our location we had five acres on state route 43 and then we moved here we bought this farm in 2018 we bought 10 acres had a house and one small building on it um but the the property did have about 40 to 50 big pine trees on them so we, uh, we cut those trees down and we had the trees sawed into lumber and it was enough to build our two barns, which house all of our laying hens and uh, our sheep are kept here on this premises and we raise the turkeys here. The turkeys, turkeys are in the same barn as the sheep, but it's different seasons of the year. So everything works, works out when the turkeys are here the sheep are out on pasture in the summer and uh, when the sheep are here the turkeys are over for Thanksgiving so um, another thing is financing on the farm is hard we don't there's no weekly paycheck we don't there's no paycheck from anybody other than our, our eggs is our most steady sales of the year so we do use, uh, we use revolving lines of credit to get by when there's no, those, those months, there's months with no income. Um, back when we got started, it, it, one of the hardest things about getting started with farming is having the finances to do it because I wasn't able to make my money the old fashioned way and inherit it. So we've, I've never had anything given to me, literally nothing. Um, me and Stacy, we just back four or five years ago when we started with more row crops, we found a banker that believed in us. And uh, yeah, so we've just built a great relationship with them. And uh, yeah, we, the last couple of years, um, crop prices have been terrible. Um, one of the things that we went through was we weren't able to get a loan from the bank. So we actually, uh, we had to go through a friend. We got a loan to buy a combine from a friend because the bank said, no way crop prices were horrible. There was no outlook for it. And, uh, we were able to, we were able to pay it off in two years just by not having to pay somebody 
a custom harvesting fee. So, cause you're talking to harvest 500 acres, we were looking at like a 20 to $25,000 bill at the end of the year. It's just right out of your pocket. And uh, yeah, so that's, that's just one of the things we kind of face here. Um, some of our future goals is we want to have a, uh, we want to build storage facility for grain so that we can try to hold maybe 50% of our crop so that we don't have to sell it right at harvest because the market is flooded right at harvest all the time. So naturally that's when prices go down. And if you can hold some crops into January, February and sell them, then it works out a lot better. And another future goal is to pay off our current property and buy more farmland to expand because as time goes on, it seems like you're only going to be able to farm what you own. And we haven't figured out how to make a living off of 20 acres yet. So we still uh, definitely lease land and go from there. So roll with the questions, I guess. <laughs> Mason. Hey, very good. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Sure. Yeah. Go ahead, Tom. Thank you. Thank you for a great presentation. Very interesting. You mentioned that uh, the meat processors uh, require almost a year in advance to make an appointment. Why is that? Why? Why? What has caused that change? Uh, um, trickle trickle down is what I like to say. Like whenever back whenever they shut JBS down and they shut all those big packing plants down, people were scared that they weren't going to be able to get meat. So they all started calling the local farmer and going, hey, we want to buy a cow from you so we have meat for a year. And there were people just started calling and booking these appointments because they got they got scared and, and, and then it just, it just went crazy. And now there's, there's two processors I know of that they can't get you in until 2022, I believe. Wow. Wow. They're, they're booked for this whole year, but people just, they really grabbed onto the local thing all of a sudden and went, Hey, I want to know where my food's coming from. And, uh, and there's, there's not that many people doing it anymore. There's only a handful, five or six local shops that are what we call custom butchering. Right. Wow. Interesting. My other question is you mentioned you're buying two milk cows. How come you're doing that and how are you going to milk them? <laughs> well, here, the first one was a gift. <laughs> <laughs> um, good friends of ours gave, gave my wife a four month old Jersey, Jersey cow for Christmas a year ago. And, uh, uh, no, it was two years ago. So we actually, we just, we took her back to his farm and he, uh, he artificially inseminated her to a Jersey so that we'll have a little Jersey calf and it's due in May. We'll keep you posted on that one. But we just want to have milk and just make butter, just just a family cow, like back in the day. And eventually, my wife would like to get a little facility and pasteurize it and sell milk or sell herd shares. I think there's something to be had there. Uh, I have a question. Uh, first, a comment. You guys are incredible. Uh, <laughs> you're, you're just Renaissance people. What? Uh, and, and I appreciate so much of what you're doing and your inventiveness of finding ways to make a dollar. Uh, I'm just totally impressed. I do have a question though. Do you expect the processing side of it to level back out to where it was? I mean, will processing plants come back online? Um, and was the reason they closed down the pandemic? Uh, well, it's anybody's guess if the reason they closed down was the pandemic, but they said all them ones out, you know, out West that kill 50,000 cattle a day that, you know, them workers had COVID and that's why they closed down, but they're back open now. Um, 
I do see in a couple, it, it's going to take a year or two for things to get leveled back out. Um, because there's, there's been one started over, uh, I can't think of the name of the town, but I think there's a, there's people that are wanting to build processing plants now because there's such a demand for it locally. Um, yeah, I, I think it'll level out. It'll level out. But for us, I, I actually found a processor and this guy, he just kind of thinks like we do, you know, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. And we helped him out when he was, he was kind of slow. He was just getting started when all this hit and uh, we helped him out. We had a lot of cattle process last summer through him. And he told me, he said, you need something done. You call me and let me know. So it, it works out. Nice. I have a question about your meat production. Obviously majority of your turkeys go to Dumas. Is that correct? Uh, well, Dumas does the advertising for us. And then we, we take all the phone calls and everybody orders through us. Mr. Duma, he says it's just easier to do it that way. And uh, that, that's how we do it. So you're the tent out in the parking lot of Dumas at Thanksgiving? We are. We are. <laughs> all right. How about as far as the rest of your meat, how much of it goes to the farmer's market and how much do you sell elsewhere? Um, I would say 20% of the beef that I raise goes to farmer's market. Um, probably the other 40, another 40% 40 we sell by like the half in the whole just to customers that call and want a side of beef for, um, yeah, and then the other 40% we sell at livestock auction as finished steers or sell some feeder calves in the spring. But, and pigs, the only pigs that we raise go, you know, I only raise enough pigs for farmer's market and for my customers because raising, raising pigs is a, that's a real good money losing proposition, <laughs> unless you can get them sold privately or, or through the farmer's market. Mason, this, this is uh, Lion Kennedy. I have a question. Uh, listening to your presentation and the diversification you have in your operation, uh, I have a, what is, as you look at it, what's the future of your kind of business? And along with that, as you look to your growing sons, the possibility of the opportunity of them joining your, your operation, it's a very interesting kind of setup, and I'm just interested how you look to the long-term future. Ah, oh, boy, oh boy. Well, if you want the, the hard, honest truth, we don't look no more than about a week ahead around here. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, I, I just got to, we got we to gotta see where, see where the boys want to go as, as they get older, um, they're very interested in farming now. So we've got that going for us, but I tell them all the time that, you know, if they, if they feel they want to go do something else, they're not, they're not tied to this in any way, shape or form. Um, if they would want to do it, it, nothing would make me prouder, you know, but Harlan, he, he's got his heart set on being a fireman. So yeah. If he wants to be a fireman, he can definitely farm as well. So we know how much those guys go to work. <laughs> but, uh, but not yeah, much at all. Nah, <laughs> hey, you said it. You said it. But uh, there's just when as they get older, we'll kind of see what direction they want to go. But we're ever changing as well. Who, who knows? We could be doing some other kind of farming in another. 10 years you never know you just gotta kind of conform but it looks like now we're almost what goes around comes around and all the farmers that are doing one thing now it seems like they're the ones that are struggling and we've diversified ourselves so much that if one thing doesn't make money 
maybe another one will, and it'll it'll cover you. But next year, the th- the thing, the lost money this year might be what carries you next year. Mm-hmm. So diversification is key, and I just hope they follow that if they do continue in farming. What what do you see as the future of a small farm? Aren't there? I mean, it seems like you see all these mega farms, particularly in Indiana and and the Midwest. Is are are small farmers on the uptick, or or how would you what would you say? Uh, I don't really know how to answer that. I it, it definitely you got to you got to be growing. Um, you always got to be looking for the next thing and growing, but these small farms, it seems like they're here. These people try to do it for, you know, they try and farm off of five or six acres, but they're around for a year or two and they're gone. Um, A lot of the land that I lease, I mean, I've built relationships with these people over the last 30 years of my life to be able to farm their land because that's, that's one of the hardest challenges we face is getting the land to plant a crop on to be able to rent that land and have the landowners trust to do it. Uh, I have another question. You, you mentioned um, a lot of things about farming, but you obviously, and you mentioned that you have a lot of equipment. Are you also a mechanic and repair all your equipment, keep uh, all of these things uh, sharp and running and, or do you get help doing that? We, we do, we do our best to do all our own mechanical work. Um, as I said, when I bought a combine, that was the big thing. I bought a combine that my dad had one brand of combine growing up and that was a gleaner. If anybody's familiar with farming, um, I bought a case international and I didn't know which end of this thing was, which when I bought it two years ago. And well, unfortunately we've, we have worked on that thing a lot, but, uh, yeah, we do 95% of our own mechanical work. And I, I do hire a guy to help me on the combine because he knows them front to back. So somehow yep. I thought you'd say that. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> um, I have a question. Uh, so the, uh, you said that I know you work at that, go to that, you sell your, your, uh, products at the Kent Farmers Market. Are you, do you participate in any of the other local markets? No, we just, we just go to Kent. It seems like it's the only one that we can really find time to do. So. Okay. So I don't need to bother at any of the other ones then. No, no, just Kent, just Kent. They've been good to us. So we stay there. Mason, this may be a too personal of a question you don't want to answer it that's fine but what does a combine set you back nowadays uh my my combine with uh i i bought it with a header to do soybeans it set me back twenty thousand dollars and then i had to buy a header to take corn off and that set me back five thousand so but that's a that's a thirty year old combine, a brand new one. You're looking at at you'll have a half a million to get set up, and my thirty year old one does the same thing as the new one does, just a little bit slower, and maybe uh, it doesn't have a refrigerator in the cab like some of the new ones. <laughs> so we get by. I'm, I'm assuming it's not GPS controlled either, like your tractor you were talking about. Well, it's, it's not, but the GPS systems that we use, I could adapt it to it. Um, our, our tractors, I mean, our tractors too, once again, they're 30 years old, so we don't have to deal with electronics and death and everything else. We can still work on them. But when you drive down the road and you see those corn rows that are just straight as an arrow, don't think that that farmer can just drive that straight because he's using GPS. <laughs> hey, Mason, um, as you look around all the uh, land that's still in Portage County, it seems like a lot of farmland isn't being farmed. Is, uh, is that your perception too, or am I off base? Well, where's, where's it at? 
<laughs> um, I think every acre that can be farmed is being farmed. We we farm all the way from Randolph, uh-huh. almost almost into Atwater, clear up to Streetsboro. Um, the biggest piece of land I have I rent is in Talmadge, um, but it's. Yeah, if it's not being farmed, there's a darn good reason. It's either, you know, just a wet hole or, or whatever. But if you know where there's any at that ain't being farmed, send it my way. <laughs> okay, as I drive through Portage County, I'll remember that. It hey, just seems like me... there, there just seems like we have a, a lots of land. And uh, I would think that's, that's undeveloped. I guess I'm looking more undeveloped land. But what you're suggesting, it may not be good for farming. Yeah, yep, yeah, that's it. And a lot of a lot of places they stripped topsoil off of fifty years ago. If there's no topsoil on it, you can't farm it. So well Mason, yep. we have a Mason, we have a custom that uh, for our programs that we have a responder to the program. And uh, we're gonna do that right now to kind of wrap up the meeting. But I wonder if you w- would be willing to hang around for a few minutes afterwards if there's any further questions. I'll be on to end the meeting. Yeah, no problem. Okay, at this point in time, I'm going to call on Dave Myers to do our response. All right. Thanks, President Randy, and thank you, Mason, um, for being with us today and and sharing what you do uh, as part of our community here in Portage County. And uh, I know uh, my family loves uh, going to the farmer's market and uh, seeing you guys and uh, heading down to Dumas, and it's it's just uh, a real pleasure to hear all the things you do that that to provide local locally grown, uh, properly grown uh, products to to us. Um, you know, we can. It's easy to to forget what goes into uh, to what you do, and just go to the grocery store and pick up your eggs and bacon. But um, what you do is is really awesome, as Doug Fuller said. And um, you know, hats off to you. Um, for, for you know, learning from your father and passing it down to your sons and uh, congratulations on, on them and, and their successes too. So uh, thanks for sharing uh, with us today and it's been a pleasure having you. Thank you.